Virginia was central to the American story for much of its history. It was key in the early colonial period, the American Revolution, and especially the early days of the Republic when it was instrumental in the creation of the Constitution and the shaping of the presidency until the 1820s. Its importance remained throughout the Civil War, but after its loss, it never regained its lofty status. To see why, join me for this brief look at the history and politics of Virginia. Compared to other portions of the East Coast, Native Americans seem to have arrived fairly late in the Virginia area, settling there after 8000 BCE. In the Piedmont area to the west, the tribes of the Sioux language family included the Manahoac, Monacan, and Tutelo. In the southwestern and southeastern portion were the Cherokee and Ottawa, respectively, both part of the Iroquoian language community as were the Susquehanna, who had migrated from what is now Pennsylvania into the upper portions of the Chesapeake Bay. Further south the coast, the dominant Native Americans were the Algonquian-speaking members of the group known as the Powhatan Confederacy, named after its powerful chieftain. In addition to hunting and fishing, especially along the bountiful coastal waters of the Chesapeake Bay, the tribes turned to agriculture, which flourished in the excellent soil and long warm growing season of the area. One of their major innovations was the growth and cultivation of tobacco, which the Native Americans would later pass on to English settlers shortly after their arrival in 1607. The English were not the first Europeans to reach what is now Virginia, however. That distinction goes to the Spanish, who in 1540 arrived in what is now Lee County in search of gold as part of the Hernando de Soto expedition. No precious minerals were found, however, so there were few follow-ups for 20 years, in the 1560s and 1570s, however, there were multiple reconnaissance and settlement expeditions, including the first to explore the lower Chesapeake under the leadership of Antonio Velazquez, and then the first attempt to settle in the future state with the establishment of a mission called Ajacán in what is now the Virginia Peninsula. This ended up being an ill-fated outpost, however, as the mission was destroyed by the natives, and Don Luis, a Virginian Indian, the Spanish had kidnapped a decade earlier, taken to Spain, and brought back, intending him to be a guide and interpreter. The governor of Spanish Florida, Pedro Menendez de Avila, would send yet another expedition to explore the Chesapeake Bay in 1573, but the Spanish would never again attempt to settle the area. Instead, it would be the British who would do so under the auspices of a privately joint stock company, which intended to search for gold in the area, something Virginia, of course, did not have. The attempt began in December 1606, when 104 colonists set sail in three ships, the Susan Constant, Godspeed, and Discovery, under the leadership of Christopher Newport. Worried about Spanish attacks, they searched for weeks for a suitable spot until they opted for a place along the James River, a waterway they named after the king, as was also the case with the new settlement, Jamestown. This would end up being the first permanent British outpost in the Americas. The new colony was named Virginia after Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen, the name that had originally been given to the failed outpost in North Carolina. The new Virginia was part of a grandiose land grant from the English Crown, which stretched from what is now southern Maine to California, and included both the island of Bermuda and the modern Canadian province of Ontario. However, despite the imperial designs, during its early days, Jamestown was hard-pressed to simply survive and barely weathered internal division disease, and near starvation. Even worse were the constant attacks by Native Americans, as conflict between the Powhatan nation and the colony exploded into war in 1609, 1622, and 1644. The first of these was famously settled in 1614, when Pocahontas, the daughter of Powhatan, the native's paramount leader, was married to one of the colonists, John Rolfe. That the colony survived at all those early years had much to do with Captain John Smith, who was initially able to trade for food with the natives and later managed to create a sustainable farming and fishing system for the colony. The other thing that helped was the discovery of tobacco as a cash crop, which would be exported to England as early as the 1620s. Tobacco brought other consequences as well, however. First, its plantation quickly degraded the soil, requiring new land to grow it, and thus needed constant expansion. This, in turn, meant steady encroachment on natives' land, which exacerbated tensions. Even worse, Pocahontas was no longer around as she had died in 1617 when she was barely in her 20s, and her father also died in 1618, bringing new leadership to the natives and one that was less tolerant of the Europeans' presence. Thus, in March 1622, the Powhatan attacked the colony, wiping out a third of it hoping that would be its end. Instead, the English retaliated, severely damaging the power of the natives and seizing even more land. The conflict would continue for a little over a decade. 
Meanwhile, tobacco also created a massive demand for labor, part of which was filled with black Africans. The first arrived as indentured servants in 1619, but by the 1630s, slavery would be introduced, and by 1661, it was legalized, at which point there were about 950 enslaved people in the colony, out of a population of 27,000. At the same time, the colony looked to attract European settlers. In 1618, the Virginia Company, still the legal owner of the province, set up their new governor, George Yearly, with a new charter, which established that immigrants who paid their own way to Virginia would receive 50 acres of land and not be mere tenants. This, in turn, led in 1619 to the creation of a legislative assembly at Jamestown, the first to be organized in the English colonies. Even though Virginia became a royal colony in 1624 after the 1622 Powhatan attack, meaning the Virginia Company was dissolved and the British Crown had direct authority over the province, the House of Burgesses, as the assembly was known, remained a potent force in colonial affairs, including encouraging growth and development. In eastern Virginia, especially along the rich lands of the Tidewater, tobacco farming brought enormous wealth to planters, merchants, and traders. Just like before, however, encroachment on natives' lands brought trouble. War broke out in 1644, once again with natives, killing around 400 colonists. This time, the man who led both the 1622 and 1644 attacks, Opechancano, was captured, and the settler who was assigned to guard him killed him. This did not end tensions, however, or even violence, as individual natives and settler communities continued to clash. Finally, in 1676, after the governor of Virginia, William Berkeley, refused to provide support to drive the indigenous people out of the colony, an armed rebellion developed with the militias previously aimed at fighting the natives, now turned against the Virginian government. Led by Nathaniel Bacon, it amassed thousands of colonists from all classes, and after running the governor out of town, managed to take over Jamestown temporarily. He would issue the Declaration of the People, a document accusing the governor of excessive taxation and judicial corruption, its first of its kind in the colonies. Bacon then left the capital and set out to capture him, but lost it to the governor's men and in retaliation torched Jamestown on September 19, 1676. Bacon's men would continue plundering the countryside, but the rebellion would soon be repressed by the Royal Navy, and once Bacon unexpectedly died of dysentery on October 16th of that year, the rebellion collapsed. The episode would have a number of consequences, including the removal of Berkeley as governor by the Crown and the temporary relocation of the capital into Middle Plantation, a site equidistant from the James and York Rivers. Jamestown was rebuilt, but when it burned down accidentally in 1698, the capital was permanently moved back to Middle Plantation, which was then renamed Williamsburg in honor of the new king. Jamestown would then lose its importance and fall into ruins. Part of the reason for choosing Middle Plantation as a permanent capital was that in 1693, the king granted a charter for William and Mary, one of the oldest colleges in the United States, second only to Harvard. Thus, by 1699, those buildings were available for government business until a new capital could be built, which it was in 1705. The following decades were marked by expansion west, as the creation of the Great Wagon Road allowed for its settlement. Thus, it was during this period that Harrisonburg, Roanoke, and Lynchburg were first settled. This was promoted as a way to shield Virginia from the natives and even French settlements not far from the Blue Ridge Mountains. But not surprisingly, it led to tensions with both. And in 1754, this exploded into an all-out war known in the U.S. as the French and Indian War. A sizable number of Virginians participated in that conflict, but none more important than George Washington, a man born at a tobacco plantation in present-day Westmoreland County in 1732. Washington distinguished himself during the conflict and would gain valuable military and political experience. Meanwhile, the war was also expensive, so the British Crown passed a series of taxes on the American colonies, which they thought was a reasonable way for them to pay for their security. The colonies thought otherwise, especially Virginia which became one of its main opponents. As early as 1763, Virginia and the British Crown clashed over the king's right to veto a provincial law aimed at lowering clerical salaries. Known as Parsons' Cause, it brought notoriety to Patrick Henry, a young lawyer born in Studley in 1736 who argued in favor of colonial rights. Tensions over taxes continued. In 1765, the Virginia House of Burgesses officially opposed the Stamp Act, and in 1769, Virginia launched a boycott of all British goods to protest additional taxes which the colonists regarded as unfair and illegal.
As things deteriorated even further across the provinces, but especially Massachusetts, supporting patriot groups known as Committees of Correspondence developed all along the colonies. In Virginia, these included men like Thomas Jefferson, George Mason, and Patrick Henry, among others, who soon advocated for a tougher stance against the British crown, most famously the latter, who in March 1775 delivered a speech advocating for the arming of the Virginia militia with the famous line, Give me liberty or give me death. Roughly eight months later, on November 7th, Lord Donmore, the governor of Virginia, declared the colony an open rebellion, leading to the first great battle of the war within Virginia territory on December 9, 1775. The Battle of Great Bridge, which the Patriots won, and thus forced Lord Donmore to leave the colony permanent. This, in turn, paved the way for Virginia to declare itself independent on May 6, 1776, and of course for Thomas Jefferson to follow up with a national declaration. War would still continue for another five years, however, with a number of obvious consequences. But a more immediate one was yet another shift of the capital from Williamsburg to Richmond in 1780. Both because this was a more centralized location, given Virginia's increasing western population, and as a spot theoretically safer from British attacks. The crucial climax of the war would also occur within the colony's territory, as Lord Cornwallis was forced to surrender to George Washington after the Siege of Yorktown on October 19, 1781. This in turn opened the way for the Treaty of Paris in 1783, which formally ended the war. Independence brought its own problems, not least the fact that the Articles of Confederation had too weak an executive, and the lack of coordination between states was having a huge economic cost. Virginia decisively helped to solve that problem, first by creating the first interstate compact with Maryland in 1785, which paved the way for a constitutional convention in 1787, and then by sending James Madison and George Washington, as well as five others, as their representatives. The first was instrumental in the country's constitutional design, and the second in bringing legitimacy to the proceedings. Virginia would then ratify the Constitution officially, becoming part of the Union on June 25, 1788. In that early American period, Virginia would continue significantly shaping the country at large. During the first 36 years of the Republic, the Old Dominion provided four of the first five presidents a Virginia dynasty. And even when John Adams, a man from Massachusetts, was president, Thomas Jefferson was vice president. The cabinet and the Supreme Court were full of Virginians, including the man generally considered to be the greatest of all chief justices, John Marshall. Virginia also dominated the Congress simply by weight of numbers because its population was so large. It had one-fifth of the members of the House of Representatives in the first Congress. The economy would also continue to thrive mostly around agricultural products as it expanded beyond traditional areas and farms around and beyond the Blue Ridge Mountains. Many of Virginia's main universities were also founded during this period, including the most prestigious of all, the University of Virginia, created at the behest of its founder, Thomas Jefferson, in 1819. But there was also the creation of what ended up becoming the University of Richmond in 1830, Virginia Commonwealth University in 1838, and the Virginia Military Institute in 1839, the first state military college in the country. After 1825, Virginia lost its preeminent position in the nation, but it would maintain its economic success. Unfortunately, much of it was based around enslaved people. This caused a number of attempted revolts, the two most important of which were Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831 and John Brown's attack on Harper's Ferry in what is now West Virginia. The first occurred in Southampton County in Southern Virginia. Nat Turner led a revolt that lasted four days and killed between 55 and 65 white people that was ultimately suppressed and its participants, like Nat Turner himself, were either executed or sold. The rebellion brought a serious debate and there was even an attempt in the legislature, led by Thomas Jefferson Randolph, to gradually abolish slavery, but it failed. Indeed, abolitionism was much stronger in Virginia than in other southern states. At different points it had some prominent abolitionist leaders, like Mary Berkeley Blackford, and manumission was far more common, leading to the state with the highest number of free black people in the country. As a result, when the threat to slavery caused the Deep South to secede, Virginia opted to remain in the Union. But once Lincoln called for troops to put down the Southern Rebellion, the state officially joined the Confederacy on May 7, 1861. Not all Virginians were happy with the decision, however, especially the counties in its northwestern part, which only a few weeks later organized their own convention and opted to secede from Virginia. 
These counties would eventually be admitted to the Union as a separate state with the name of West Virginia, making Virginia the only state to lose territory during the Civil War. That was not its only loss. Virginia was one of the main theaters of the war, so that it had the most battles of any one state, including key ones like the First Battle of Bull Run in 1861 and Chancellorsville in 1863. As a result, it saw the destruction of many of its cities, including the capital Richmond, which was also the seat of government for the Confederacy and much of its infrastructure. It also suffered the loss of some 31,000 men and the wounding of many more. In the end, it also lost the war. This was made official when its main general, Virginia native Robert E. Lee, signed his surrender at the Appomattox Courthouse on April 9, 1865. The state was placed under military rule in the immediate aftermath of the war, and when it was readmitted into the Union in 1870, it also gained a new constitutional charter that allowed black people to vote and created a public education system with mandatory funding and attendance. Republican rule was quite short-lived, however, more so than even in other southern states, as divisions between radicals and moderates doomed it. Democrats would regain control in 1874 and would hold the governor's office and most of the political offices in the state for nearly a century. The one exception happened in the aftermath of the war, when in 1880 the so-called Readjuster Party was first elected. Known as one of the few successful state-level parties in American history, the Readjuster organization was built across racial and party lines and was led by William Mahone. It owed its popularity to their plan to deal with the state debt and their funding of education. Beyond expanding funding to Virginia Tech, for example, which had been founded in 1872, they established Virginia State University in 1882. Their success also depended on patronage, however, and when this was lost, with the election of Grover Cleveland in 1884, it severely hurt it and soon collapsed. It did not help that it also depended on black support, which also generated it extreme opposition. Meanwhile, as the Democrats gained enough power in the state, they moved to disenfranchise African Americans. In 1902, they enacted a new constitution which established literacy tests and poll taxes, imposed racial segregation on schools, and abolished the county court system. For roughly the next 60 years, black people in the state and their allies would fight to reverse this. In fact, some of the strategies that would become the norm in the larger civil rights movement were first pioneered in Virginia. One of the first sit-ins, for example, took place at the Alexandria Library in 1939. Organized by Samuel Wilbur Tucker, it would bring a lot of media attention, but unfortunately little change. Far more successful was the use of the courts. Indeed, some of the most important legal landmarks of the civil rights movement originated in the state, including Morgan v. Virginia in 1946, which declared segregation of buses unconstitutional, Johnson v. Virginia in 1963, which desegregated juries, and perhaps most famously, Loving v. Virginia in 1967, which made bans on interracial marriage unconstitutional. This latter case was so compelling that several movies have been made out of the plaintiffs, Mildred and Richard Loving, originally from Caroline County, Virginia. The state also pioneered some anti-civil rights tactics, however. When the state was forced to integrate their schools in 1959, for example, Prince Edward County opted to close down its entire public school system rather than comply with the law. Instead, it created private schools for the white children of the county and let black kids fend for themselves. This lasted until 1964 when the Supreme Court ruled against the public money that supported the operation. Fanville did something similar with its library in 1960 and later was forced to reopen but did so without tables and chairs. Meanwhile, as all of this was happening, state politics were dominated by the so-called Byrd Operation, a political machine controlled by Senator Harry Byrd. Bolstered by its rural strength, which was in turn possible because of black disenfranchisement, the machine lasted as long as Byrd did, but once he was gone, internal divisions and the triumph of civil rights legislation made it a thing of the past. Since then, Virginia has been transformed. Its tax rate, which was once the lowest in the nation, and its public expenditures on health care and education became more balanced. Its economy, disproportionately agricultural well into the 20th century, has been transformed as a result of its proximity to D.C. and employment related to its federal agencies and defense. This is especially so in Northern Virginia, which includes, of course, the Pentagon at Arlington and the CIA at Langley, but also Hampton Roads, where the Navy and Coast Guard have a significant presence. This, in turn, has produced a massive wave of suburbanization since the 1960s. Politics has also become more competitive. Democrats lost their stranglehold of state politics in 1970. Virginia then elected its first black governor in 1989 and briefly became a red state in the 1990s. 
Today, it is a competitive state at the local level and a solidly blue state in presidential elections. And thus, although the state is no longer the dominant place within the union that it once was, it has slowly regained economic prominence and political relevance, and that trend seems likely to continue.